This is a tennis court, and these are tennis players. Each and every day, millions of players just like them, just like you, hit the doubles court with one common goal. Win. Win at any cost. No, no, scratch that. Believe it or not, winning is actually not the main reason people play. Winning is just a sign, an affirmation that what you truly want out of your game is actually happening. And what do you want? You want consistent and steady progress. The need to feel that you're getting better, moving forward. Improving is an innate desire deeply instilled in all of us. And the tragedy is that thousands upon thousands of players all over the globe end up getting frozen and stuck in their game. Staying at the same level, making the same mistakes year after year. And the cause of this never ending rut in most cases has nothing to do with the inability to improve, but your failure to focus on the most important things that are gonna get you unstuck and into the next level in the shortest amount of time possible. Watching today's video from start to finish is the single best investment in your time if you're looking to get unstuck in your game. Hi, I'm Peter Freeman, and in my 35 years of playing and coaching, I've done some pretty cool things. I've been a state champion, a nationally ranked junior, played number one for my Division I college team. My YouTube channel has been watched millions of times all over the world and was named one of the top 10 instruction channels by Lessons.com. But talking about myself is not even remotely what this video is about. This video is about you and getting you unstuck in your game. I'm on a mission to help players all over the globe get supreme satisfaction out of this unbelievable sport. And I want to start the thawing out process, getting you unstuck by uncovering four big lies that are keeping you stagnant in your doubles game. Number one is that there's only one no man's land, and there's actually two. And players are actually being encouraged to enter this secret no man's land, and they're paying for it big time in their matches. Number two is the misconception that you need to be a young person to be an effective poacher and that you need to have incredible volleys. You can actually be a great poacher at any age, at any skill level, and you want to be that so you can help your partner win and hold their serve. Number three is the total myth that controlling a point is done by highly skilled shots. I'm going to show you an example how a gentleman over the age of 50 is able to completely dominate the court simply by being in the right place at the right time. And number four is the lie and belief that countless private lessons looking to improve your technique is the fastest way to get unstuck in your game. Now no one believes in solid fundamentals more than me, but it's not the fastest way to get unstuck and reach that next level of success and I'm going to reveal a complete system that's designed to get you unstuck in your game. But more on that later. Let's start the thawing out process by showing you the secret no man's land. And what may shock you is that you've been encouraged to go there by maybe one of your local coaches. And it's killed you in matches over and over again. And also be sure to make notes and stick around to the end of this video if you're serious about improving your game. Today's video is the single best investment of your time if you want to improve your game and get unstuck. And at the end of the video, I actually have two big rewards. So let's get started and let's find out what is this secret no man's land. All right guys, so let's get into today's lesson. So today's lesson is the secret no man's land. But before we go through that, I want to point out five areas of the court that's really going to help you understand what uh, mode you're in as far as are you in offense, defense, or is the point neutral, and how you kind of want to have your mindset, how you want to play that point out. It's something that I like to use for singles and doubles. It really helps me make smart shot selections on autopilot. And once you get used to it, it's not like you're thinking, okay, I'm in area five or I'm in area four. You just kind of know that you are, and you know the right shots to choose from. So it's, it's a great way to play tennis. Right now, we're gonna start out in area Five. And I'm going to bring in a couple of uh, friends who we were playing some doubles with this morning. So we'll bring on Seth and Matt. If you guys come on in here. So here we are. We're here with a couple of my friends and we're in area five. And first of all, if you're in area five and you're back here, you're on defense. So 
Matt, let me ask you this. When you're playing a match, is your goal usually to be on offense or on defense? I would like to be on offense. I remember you said offense. What did you say, offense? Offense all the time. Offense all the time. Seth, you like being on offense or defense? I prefer offense. He prefers offense. And they hit some strong balls, and it's fun to be on offense. Now, the thing about defense, though, is I think it gets too much of a negative connotation, right? You know, oh, I'm on defense. I'm in trouble. And if you really look at all sports, defense wins championships, and tennis is no important. If you, if you watch a football game, you hear defense wins championships, basketball, baseball. And if you look at a couple of our greatest players of all time, Rafael Nadal, Novak Djokovic, they're not afraid to play some great defense and be patient in a defensive position. Now what happens in tennis is often, especially in doubles, I find lots of people will not even voluntarily go back to Area 5. They never even get here and they really need to. And even if you watch the Bryan brothers who are an extremely offensive doubles team, they are not afraid to get back in Area 5. And so we're in Area 5, we are on defense, and usually what's happened is the other team has earned the right to push us back. They're hitting good approach shots, they're coming to the net. So this is where we want to drop back from Area 4. So as we move into area four, right here, this is where we're, we're playing and we're hitting some ground strokes or we've just served the ball. Now someone hits a big shot, we wanna move back to area five to give ourselves more time. And this is typically where we're gonna be throwing up lobs. So guys, what we wanna do is rather than being stuck in area four, let's get in area five. Let's have Matt, you'll be here. Seth, you're gonna be on the other side. And depending on how you lob the ball, you want to usually have both of your teammates shade to one side or the other. We're not going to get too much of that in this video, but let's say Matt hits a lob cross court and the other person's actually moving this way. Now you think they might want to take it that way, but that becomes a very awkward shot. In general, lots of people will hit this ball inside out with their overhead. So Matt would be here to feign the corner and Seth would actually move to the middle, forcing them to hit the toughest overhead and if they can do that. Now what they want to look to do in here is not just hit one lob and then crack it, that's what a lot of people will do, but be patient. I like to think of it as kind of like a badminton match. Have you ever seen badminton where one person's hitting a ton of overheads and the other person's hitting a lot of lobs until they can get the ball at their feet? That's simply a good idea. If you can hit a lob and then if you can see a lot of green that you've really moved them back, well now you can look to maybe move into area four, three, and get at their feet again. Make the ball invite you forward, but if they're still hitting good overheads, just stay in your lob mode, all right? And until they turn their shoulders and they give you a weak ball, you're gonna stay in area five hitting lots of lobs. Matt and Seth, if you guys come in here real quick, I wanna ask you a question. You guys play, I would estimate, 4-0 to 4-5 tennis. Would you say that's correct? Yeah, yes, sir. How, out, of, out of 10 players you're to play against, how many would you say, oh, they have incredible overheads, they don't miss, they put them all away? I'd say uh, two to three. Most. Two to three. Yeah, I agree. Two to three. Two to three. And we were playing a game before you, before we actually turned the camera on. They actually have some of that footage. We'll probably show it maybe in this video. But out of about 15 points, you guys know how many times you hit a lob when we had you guys back here? We put them back in. Actually, they didn't want to go back to Area 5. They stayed more in Area 4. But how many lobs did you guys hit? Uh, one or two at most. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was one lob they hit out of about 15 points. So I just want to take a little time out from uh, what we're talking about and show you an actual point what we're doing. I apologize for it being a little dark, but I think you guys can see the point. So I put an overhead up here. It's a great drill to start with. And these guys only lobbed once in the game. And so the, the problem with that is if you have two people close in that, and their thing too is they, they didn't move back into area five enough to play defense. They pretty much played defense from area four, so it didn't give them a lot of time. But if you're back in area four or five and you have two people at the net, you know, now you're really vulnerable to, to short balls. Uh, and, but if you can move people back, see, so right there, that might not have been a bad time to lob there. But since I'm close to the net and they're both far back, a little drop shot now all of a sudden becomes a winner. And, and again, these guys are fast. So it, it goes to show even when you're playing fast young people, if you're not hitting the right shots, it's, it's hard to get to the ball. So lots of times you're feeling slow out there, not because you are slow, but because of the shot selection, where if you lob the ball 
Now all of a sudden it moves us back, and it's very hard for us to hit a short ball. We're going to have to hit the ball deeper back to you, and then you can maybe return the ball back at our feet. So uh, that's why I say defense wins championships and don't be afraid to lob. So guys like this, what they want to do is do more defense, then you'll get more invited to set up the offense. Okay? All right, next we're going to move into area four. All right, guys, now we're in area four, and depending on what style of play you are uh, in doubles, uh, it's going to determine how much you're actually in area, in area four. What are we doing in area four just on a given? Well, we're serving, definitely serving from area four, and we're also returning lots of times. If someone has a pretty good serve, we're in general going to be back in, in area four. Now, depending on your style of play, you're going to decide, well, am I going to serve in volley? Am I going to hit a return and come on in? Or am I going to play some baseline? And the game's changed a lot to where most of the time your coach would tell you in the old days, you got to get to the net on every point. But you're seeing lots of pro tennis players now stay back. So, Matt, let me ask you this. When you play, do you serve in volley or do you serve and stay back? Do you mix it up? In general, what do you like to do? Um, I like to serve and um, stay back. He likes to serve and stay back in doubles, okay? So once the point starts for Matt, a couple of things are going to happen. He's either going to serve and get to a neutral rally, and for the most part, he's going to be wanting to hit the ball cross court so he avoids the net person, less the net person is not very good at the net, or he's able to move inside the court. In general, he's going to hit the ball cross court. Is that usually what you do? Yes, that's usually what I do. Okay, and he's looking for one of two things to happen. The thing he's hoping will happen is he can eventually move up to area three or two and then take the net. So even though you're serving stay back, you would ultimately like to move forward if you can, right? Yes, all the time. I try to move into that net. Yeah, because he likes offense all the time, as he said. But what a lot of people refuse to do in Area 4 is move back to Area 5 like we talked about in the previous section when I was talking. So when someone hits a good shot on you, Matt, I just want you to be more open-minded to be moving back into Area 5 okay. and throw up some lobs. Other than that, we're going to start moving into Area 3 and Area 2. Now we're going to bring Seth back in here for that. So now we're here with, with Matt and Seth in area three and area two. This is a, a part of the court where we want to be getting uh, to the net. We're on more offense most of the time in this situation. Uh, but before we get into that, uh, first of all, have you guys, you guys have pretty nice strokes. Have you taken many tennis lessons with an instructor? Um, a couple singles lessons, but never doubles. Never doubles, a couple singles. So not too many lessons. Mm -hmm. Yes. What about you, Seth? No, not really. Now, I can tell they say the game because they both have really pretty strokes to watch. Technically, very, very nice tennis. Now, no, not many lessons, but if you get in, in here and you're hitting a number of shots, what, what is this area called? Have you ever heard of a name for this area of the court? Um, no Man's Land. No Man's Land. Yep, No Man's Land. Everybody kind of learns No Man's Land pretty early, and the idea of No Man's Land is we don't want to be here, all right? And I think that's another misconception about tennis is you actually want to spend a lot of time in no man's land as far as hitting shots, returning serve. I notice I'll see some people play, they're playing a really weak opponent and the person has a terrible serve and they're still staying back there because they don't want to be in no man's land. I think especially those beginners, two fives, even up to three fives are thinking don't spend any time in no man's land where we actually want to get a lot of shots in no man's land. We just don't want to hit a lot of shots in a row. Because once you're hitting two to three shots in a row, you're going to get stuck in no man's land. A ball is going to get at your feet, or you're going to hit a weak shot to your opponent and get the ball put away, or your partner is actually going to get smashed in the face. So we don't want that in no man's land. All right, guys, so now let's move up. We're doing a good job. We got no man's land, but we hit, and we did our job, and we got out of here. And so this is area three and two. Now we're going to move up to area one. And actually, in this section, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep my friend Matt in the video. So we're going to be in area one and we're going to uh, have Seth come back in a couple of minutes. All right, so me and Matt, we're actually now in area one, which I consider the ultimate winning position. This is the, the chance where we can really start to put the ball away and win a lot of points. Unfortunately, a lot of mistakes are made in here. And I, I, I took Matt in here because Matt's got a lot of great strokes. And he gives himself, he, he has instant offense, he gives himself a lot of opportunity to win a lot of points in area one. And I think what you're going to learn today, Matt, if you're able to apply it in your matches, is going to have you win a lot more at the net. Would you like that? I would love that. <laughs> okay, very cool. So we were playing some points, and I actually found that Matt 
lived in the secret no man's land. So how many no man's lands have you heard of so far in tennis? Is it just one? Uh, just one. Right. Most people have heard of just one. There's actually two in my mind. And most people are guilty of going into the secret no man's land and they're losing a lot of points. It's the reason why they don't want to come to the net because they feel that they lose so many points and they're not sure why. So we're going to go over that. So uh, first of all, Matt, if I'm right here, you've probably heard of the word closing the net. Have you heard of close the net? Yes. And is closing the net been something that's been a positive thing? Is that a good thing? Have you been encouraged to close the net? Yes, I've been encouraged all the time to close the net. Yeah, yeah. I've been encouraged to close the net as well growing up. Close the net, get on the net, and maybe it's a mistake that, that the coaches do. They don't really explain it clearly. We do want to close the net, but we don't want to overclose. When you overclose, this is when you're going to get lobbed. And Matt, what you were doing is you would you would go, you'd get instant offense, and then you'd pass this area right here, and you would move in the secret no man's land. This is what I call secret no man's land. I have this cone right here. I think this is actually ultimate winning position. And once you cross this, it becomes secret no man's land, right? You're, you're trying to close, you're trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. but what's happening is you're overclosing and you're getting very susceptible to the law. And this is what a lot what happens. A lot of people say, well, I come to the net, I try and close, and then I get lobbed. And does that mean we don't want to hit any volleys in secret no man's land? What do you think? Do we want to hit volleys in secret no man's land or do we not want to hit volleys there? Uh, I think we want to hit some hit some volleys at the fence. Yep. Yep. Just like we want to hit approach shots in the first no man's land, we want to hit a lot of volleys if we can in secret no man's land. The thing is, is we just don't want to be there two or three shots in a row. That's when we're going to get lobbed. Okay. All right, so here we actually see Matt entering the secret no man's land uh, to where he hits that volley. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with coming in and hitting a volley this close, but I'd like him to recover a little further back, and then you'll see a lot. He's easily lobbed. So this, this guy is very fast. He should be a dominating presence up at the net, but since he's mostly used to singles, you know, he doesn't quite feel comfortable up there yet. So then the lob goes up, and then he runs right on top of the net, too. So, and he's more off to the side in the alley right there. So right now, I think based on that lob going over, uh, it wasn't quite going on his side, but he should be moving more over here and to the middle and be planted there. So if the ball comes, he can then steal the next ball over the middle. Now, again, when that ball comes back over the net... There's going to be no pressure on the opponents to keep it away from a net person. You always want to feel uh, that you're putting pressure on your opponent to make a really good shot. Right here, he's basically becoming a non-factor in the point. And again, with a great, um, as an athlete as he is, and young, he should be able to be a dominating factor. So you can see throughout this whole point here, he's not quite feeling comfortable. He's, now he's way over here in the doubles alley. So he's moving to a lot of spots that ideally he does not want to be in. And once he learns how to more stay in this area of the court over here in between shots and learn how to close the middle and dominate and stay out of the secret no man's land, he's going to become a much stronger tennis player in doubles. So the way I want you to play actually from now on is when you get an approach shot and you're coming and you've hit your approach shot, let's say you're hitting it here. Let's say you're hitting an approach shot here. You want to move up into right about here. This is ultimate winning position. And I want you to pretend that there is a force field. Okay? okay? okay. As, as, as long as you're approaching and before they're hitting the ball, you need to stay here. Okay. This is where you're going to get your final split steps. Now, as they hit the ball and you see it's floating, this gives you permission to open up the force field and move in the secret no man's land and put the ball away. Okay. And you should be able to feel that as you're moving up in there, are you going to put the ball away, looking at the court, you know, feeling what you're doing with the ball, and is there an opening? So if you feel that there's an opening, you can just close in and put the ball away. You can actually just move there and stay there and you've won the point. Okay. But if you go there and you hit the frame, or they're playing really good defense and you can see they're going to play it again. This is where you've got to volley and then get out of this. The force field is going to close up real quick. So you get out, make sure you're not going to get stuck in that secret no man's land. Okay. And you get back here and you're looking for the next ball. 
and then every time they hit, if you can get back in the secret no man's land and win the point, that's great. But at least you're going to be able to get a lob or other things that are going to come up right. in a match. All right, so are you ready to use that? I'm ready to use it. All right, so good luck to Matt and good luck to you guys out there. And that is the secret no man's land lesson for today. All right, so thanks for watching that video. And now's our chance to dive even deeper together to learn more. So I really want to help you with, with some uh, big rewards here. First, first one is, is I want to help your specific challenge. So there's probably something that you feel that if you could just improve, whether it's being at the right place at the right time or improving a certain stroke, if you could just improve that one thing, it could jump you to the next level in your doubles game. So I want you to do right now is comment below, and I'm going to be reading everybody's comments, and I'll read your specific comment and let you know if I think you're on the right track, if you're focusing on the right thing and what you might want to do to help improve that one big challenge. And so make sure you comment below. Now, the, the next thing is I want to reward people. The more you're engaged in this whole process, the more I'm going to give back and the more you're going to get out of it. So we're coming out with four videos. This is video number one. And if you comment on all four videos, because that lets me know that you're engaged in the process, I'm going to reward you by entering you into a raffle to where you can win a free racket bag of your choice. So if you play with a head, I'll buy you a really nice head bag. If you play with a Wilson, a Prince, whatever your preference is, I'm gonna get you a bag for that. And also, uh, another big thing I wanna offer you is if you've watched today's video and you just already have that feeling, you already know that what the points I'm hitting on are really what you need to do to get to the next level and you wanna dive much deeper into this kind of content, uh, full transparency, I am doing this, I'm giving you this free series because I'm an online tennis coach and it's how I make my living. So crazy concept, I want to show you I can help you by actually helping you and that's the concept behind the free videos. So if you kind of already get that feeling that yeah, I need to learn a lot of this stuff that he's about to get into, what you can do is click over here and you can learn more about next level doubles you can have access to the course before anyone else gets access to it. If you're like, yeah, I, I want to dive in, I'm ready to get deeper on this, you can click over here to get started on that. And then finally, I want you to, if you're not quite ready for that, I want you to be watching your inbox like a hawk because the next video we're going to get into is a pretty cool concept. I know everybody wants to learn how to poach and they know poaching is a good idea, but they're afraid to do it for a variety of reasons we're not going to get into right now today. But I want you to watch your inbox. I'm going to show you a video on no risk poaching to where you can learn to poach in real matches without any risk. So be looking out for that. And this is Pete signing off. Thanks for watching today's video.